Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For you, O Lord, are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, today we gather to remember and contemplate uh, the one thing we all have in common, the one thing that all human beings have in common. It doesn't matter uh, who we are, or where we're from, or even what we believe, we are all going to die. You know that, right? No one gets out of here alive. At the end of the day, we are all worm food, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. Maybe you've seen that uh, bumper sticker. Whoever dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> and there is something sad and tragic, a bit scary about that which is why we spend so much time avoiding death, denying death, trying to push it back, stave it off, keep it out. But not today, not today, and perhaps not for the next 40 or so days as we journey through this penitential season of Lent. Today we give up our denial. We give up our pretensions of immortality. We stare death full in the face. And we discover, perhaps, that it's not as bad as we might fear. A good friend of mine who is a clergyman has an app on his phone called We Croak. Not We Work, We Croak. And the only thing this app does is a few times over the course of every day at random moments, it will remind him that someday he's going to die, which sounds a little depressing. And he's not a depressive type. He's a, a wonderful priest with an amazing wife and three uh, incredible girls. You'd think that would be depressing, but actually, he said, being reminded of his mortality, of his death, has been incredibly liberating, freeing powerful reminder that whatever he's going through, whatever thoughts occupy his mind, whatever anxieties he may carry, it's not going to last forever. He's only human. He's only mortal. He's small. Another friend of mine who's also a, a priest up in New York um, works with an older, wonderful, wiser um, priest, a, a female priest. And sometimes my friend uh, gets in his head a little bit gets a little anxious, gets a little fearful. I know that never happens to any of you, but for us priestly types, sometimes we get a little anxious about our lives, about our ministry. Are things going to work out? How's it going to go? And he said when he gets in those moments and his colleague, this older, wiser priest, can tell that he's really anxious, she'll lean over, she'll say, Jake, remember, you're not that important. <laughs> And he says that always just brings a wave of calm and relief over him. He's not that important. He could hold himself, his life, his fears a little bit more loosely. Or I'm blessed with a lot of priest friends, I guess. Uh, Sarah Condon, who was here a few weeks ago to preach uh, powerfully about her life and her experience. Um, she told me a story once about going to her community pool in Houston. She walked in, there were tons of kids there, tons of families. All the kids were in the pool, but she noticed most of the moms weren't. They weren't even bathing suits. They were still wearing their clothes. And she said she thought probably it was because of their anxiety about how they looked, about their, their bodies. And she said she wanted to have a T-shirt made up and distributed to all of them that said, um, you're all going to die. Get in the pool. <laughs> So, remember, you're not that important. You're going to get old. Your body won't last. 
today we remember that we're all going to die. Let me give you a counterexample, which I um, found to be rather powerful. Some of you may remember uh, a woman named Susan Sontag, a very important kind of public intellectual from the second half of the 20th century. Um, she was an author and critic. She appeared in a, a Woody Allen movie. Um, she also died of cancer when she was 71, so pretty young. Her son, David Reif, wrote a book about her and her life, which was reviewed in the New York Times. And here's what the reviewer wrote about David Reif's book about his mother, Susan Sontag. Sontag's uh, confrontation with her own ordinariness is the most intriguing element of the story. For a woman who had always believed in her own exceptionality, who had defined herself by her will to be different, to rise above, the terrifying democracy of illness is one of its most painful aspects. Throughout her final illness, she tells her son, this time, for the first time in my life, I don't feel special. In the most profound and affecting passages of the book, uh, Reef questions whether on some level his mother thought that she was too special to die. He investigates the line between hubris and bravery, grandiosity and vitality. Do we ever truly accept that we'll die? Is there a part of the mind, especially for someone as ambitious, as avid as Sontag, that refuses to believe in its own extinction. Quote, her sense that whatever she could will in life she could probably accomplish had served her so well for so long that empirically it would have been madness on her part not to have made it her organizing principle, her true north, he writes. That same belief in the power of her own desire, that spectacular ambition, that intellectual bravado, made it impossible to accept that fatal illness was not another circumstance she could master. On some level, she wondered if she was too important to die. One of the things I like to say about my hopes for our church, but really kind of who I feel like we, we are and who we're becoming, is that I would love for us to be a place that takes Jesus seriously but not ourselves. You may have heard me say that before. And to me, this story about Susan Sontag is, is kind of the opposite is, of that, isn't it? Someone who took herself so seriously, who thought she was so important that almost tragically she couldn't accept her mortality. She couldn't accept the reality that she was going to die. And my guess is that that made her death rather difficult. Um, not just for her, but for the people she loved, the people who loved her. There was an article in 2010 in The New Yorker by a doctor named Atul Gawande. Uh, the article was called Letting Go, the subtitle being, uh, What Should Medicine Do When It Can't Save You? And in this article, this doctor is wrestling with what do you tell a patient when you've tried every treatment, you've done everything you can, and you just know they're not they're not going to make it, that they're going to die. And he said there's really two paths that you can take. One is you just keep fighting. You just keep fighting and fighting and fighting. You refuse to even acknowledge the possibility of death because it seems like you're, you're giving in. You're welcoming it in through the door. And a lot of people do that. They just fight until they die. And when they do, it's, it's hard it's hard on them, and it's hard on the people who love them because they didn't get a chance to say the things they needed to say. And very often, about six months to a year later, um, the loved ones of the person who just kept on fighting um, will experience some kind of depression, um, some kind of profound sadness. So that's one way. The other possibility, when you've reached the end of the line, is to accept it and to go into um, something like hospice and to say, you know, I've only got a little bit of time left, but I want to spend it as well as I possibly can with the people I love. I want to say the things that need to be said and hear the things that I need to hear. And really, it boils down to four things, 
at the end of life. I love you. I'm sorry. I forgive you. And goodbye. Those are the four important things. And I've, I will say, I've spent a lot of time with people in the final stages of their life, and I've, I've seen that. I've seen people who fought as long as they could, and then at a certain point said, I'm done. It's over. And then for the last few weeks of their life, they, they gathered around them, the people they loved, and they had what I would call a good death. I remember one son in particular, I visited in the hospital with his mom who was about to pass away, and he said, you know, RJ, this has been really hard, and I'm going to miss her so much. It's been hard, but it's been good. It's been good. I think part of today, contemplating our mortality, is living, holding the knowledge that we are going to die so that we're constantly saying those things, constantly saying, I love you, I'm sorry, I forgive you. Um, what does Jesus say? We, we don't know when the end will come. It'll come like a thief in the night. But if we can hold our mortality and not deny it, perhaps we can live in the fullness of what it means to be a human being. Two more things, then I'm done. There was a quote um, from a recent article in The Atlantic called, uh, the article is called Return of the Pagans by David Wolpe. It's about all of our inclination to worship earthly things, people, nature, money. (laughs) And here's what David Wolpe says in The Atlantic. If we don't have a God to simultaneously assure us of our centrality and our smallness, we will exaggerate both. Rabbi Simcha Bunim, a Hasidic master of the 18th and 19th centuries, used to advise his disciples to carry two pieces of paper, one in each pocket. In one pocket was the phrase, for me the world was created. In the other pocket, I am but dust and ashes. In the balance between the two lies the genuine status of the human being. I'm not a big one on Lenten disciplines because I find I'm not able to keep them. But if you're looking for a Lenten discipline, that might be a good one. Two pieces of paper, one in each pocket, one that says, for me, the world was created, and the other which says, I am but dust and ashes. That's what it means to be a human being made in the image of God. Last thing, from Paul's second letter to the church in Corinth, a reading we heard today, one of my favorite verses in all Scripture. We entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. The good news of Jesus, Christianity, is that on the cross, Jesus became sin. He took on our sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You might also say that He took on our guilt that we might become the joy of God. He took and be- on became our shame, that we might become the glory of God, that he, he took on became our death, so that we might become the life of God. So as we enter into this Lenten season, we can stare all those things in the face, our sin, our guilt, our shame, our death, knowing that because of what Jesus has done for us, None of that is the end of the story. There's life on the other side. Amen.